In this episode, I'm once again joined by Tara Springett, a Buddhist psychotherapist who specializes in treating Kundalini syndrome. Tara reveals how she works with her private clients, including how she assesses Kundalini symptoms, her five-step Kundalini test, and emergency strategies for acute distress. Tara discusses the three-part foundation for psychological and spiritual health, as well as the essential role that relationship plays in the enlightenment process. Tara also shares her experience working at the intersection of Kundalini with narcissism and other cluster B disorders, why it is that Kundalini magnifies one's latent negative tendencies, and why paranormal experiences and entity contact are inevitable for those with an awakened Kundalini energy. So without further ado, Tara Springett. Tara Springett, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Steve. Well, we were just discussing before we began recording the first episode we did together. Wow, so well received. And in that episode, we talked about your life and we talked about um, your series, really, of profound kundalini experiences and how it was you navigated those and how it was you integrated those as well as talking about your religious life studying with teachers such as Garchan Rinpoche and so on really fascinating episode and of course I will link that in the show notes below we left the last episode on a bit of a cliffhanger which was we were going to return to discuss some practicalities in your work as a Buddhist informed psychotherapist you deal in particular your specialty is working with people with kundalini symptoms of various kinds. So we're going to get practical and dive into that. Uh, what sort of cases you see, how you uh, address those cases. And we're also going to talk about some of the other outcomes of, of kundalini, such as paranormal experiences and the development of Siddhi. So that's the menu for today. So welcome back. On your site, you have a kundalini test that one can self-administer to get a sense of if one is having some sort of kundalini experience or something along those lines. So I'm curious, when you're seeing a new client, what's your protocol for assessing someone who comes to you reporting kundalini issues? They come to you and they say uh, something like, Tara, I think I have a kundalini um, issues, uh, kundalini experiences of some sort. What's your protocol for categorizing and assessing what you're hearing? Yeah, that's an important question, because I do have sometimes people who have coexisting conditions, you know, they might have um, Kundalini awakening, but they might also have a drug crisis or even drug psychosis. And some rarely, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes that people have uh, conditions like bipolar or um, other conditions. And this is important for me to, to recognize and to advise, you know, about and uh, so basically, when, when somebody comes to me, I, I get to know them a little bit, you know, how old are you, what do you do for work, uh, are you married or are you single, what, who's your most important relationship. Um, I always have to clarify whether they take drugs or medication. They, they shouldn't take drugs because taking drugs, um, even, you know, if you, take, uh, if you take alcohol, for example, that's consciousness inhibiting so they shouldn't combine that with, with the psychotherapy or counseling because that's that's the consciousness expanding and if they take uh, you know um other psychedelic drugs like lsd or um, ayahuasca that can cause big turmoil and crisis that i don't advise that people do that in combination with with my counseling because my counseling is consciousness expanding you don't need any other bomb that explodes your brain and yes and we get a consciousness expansion but not one that you wanted and not the way you wanted it so uh, cannabis does a bit of both that is consciousness ex uh, inhibiting shrinking because you're in some sort of a little bit of zoomed out state and at the same time, it can also cause terrible drug psychosis. I had so many people with drug psychosis caused by cannabis. For me, this is like a really dangerous drug. But, um, you know, I used to be a, a drugs counselor as well. So I always see crashed cases. I don't know. I see all these people who take this and have no problem with that. Anyway, so I do that. And uh, then I go through their, um, their symptoms and I have five core symptoms and this is anxiety, anger, depression, tiredness and physical pain. 
and we rate everything on a scale from zero to 10. And this is our uh, benchmark. Uh, we, when we then do um, interventions, then we always uh, check what effect did that have. So for example, the anti-anxiety technique, how is the anxiety uh, going down on the scale? And it usually does and, um, and so forth. Hmm. Then uh, um, we, we usually do a Kundalini test uh, where we go through the five criteria uh, that I have uh, developed. So basically, uh, I say to people, uh, Kundalini awakening is a very under-researched phenomenon, which is very strange because the psychiatric literature, they have, you know, uh, given everything a name and they have researched so many conditions that I find that really strange. And for me, this is very easy, recognizable. Also, if I meet somebody in a cafe or something, I often have a feeling for, for them, whether they have awakened Kundalini or not. And uh, one reason why I think that might be is that Kundalini awakening is very, very rare. How do I know this? I haven't made a study or anything. It is just because all of my cli clients, and I've spoken to thousands, thousands of clients with Kundalini awakening, but they all say that they are very, very alone with that, that they don't have others who have that, and that they find it so hard to be in this world with so few people being, you know, on their wavelength so that they can talk about it. Anyway, so I, I say to people, um, I've developed the test on the basis um, of three uh, things. One is the literature that I read. Obviously, I read every book that I could get my hands on. A lot of them are deep in folklore and maybe even superstition a bit and, uh, and, and, and personal accounts and so forth. The, the, to my knowledge, there's only two PhDs written, one by Bonnie Greenwell and the other by Yvonne Casson, um, who try to approach this and research this in a little bit more systematic, scientific way. So I tried to read everything I could get my hand on. And um, I am in this process myself, so that's now 40, for four years or 45 and uh and then i've worked i think around with around 2000 clients now in the last 11 years and um i also tra trained my colleague and my husband uh, who is my colleague uh you know, I trained him in this approach. And so we work on these things uh, together. So he, he also brings in all these clients and um, we talk about it. So altogether, I think we are around 2000 clients now. Uh, I have done the vast majority of them. And, um, and so working with all these people and giving them the advice that I do is in a, in a way you could say a research study in itself. You know, I could quite easily with the material that I have I think I could write a good PhD, but I'm not inclined in that way. And I'm also too busy and, and so forth. But I try to have my feet on the ground. I don't just like to spin theories or, or ideas and just plonk it onto people. You know, I, I really want to test my hypothesis and see, does it work, this intervention, does it work? And I write down the scale. And, and so overall, I get very good evidence-based feedback from my clients yes, this theory or this hypothesis is correct. And uh, on, on that basis, I have then developed this test and it has uh, the criteria, the most important criteria of this test is um, that somebody is extremely interested in spirituality. So that the quest for the divine or for enlightenment is all encompassing, is the centerpiece of one's life. If people can say yes to that, that, that's the, the, the most important criteria. And then uh, other then we try to f uh, have an idea when they think this might have happened, and then they say maybe 10 years ago, and then I say, compare the last 10 years and the, the previous years of your adult life, and see that as two blocks and compare that. And, and then the, 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 the questions are, um, have your emotions intensified? oh yes, <laughs> more ups, more down, you know, really in, in the extreme. So when they are up, they are in divine bliss, orgasmic bliss. When they're down, they've never been in the depths of despair. The anxiety through the roof, anger, depending on personal inclinations, anger, depression, anxiety, these kinds of emotions. The, uh, um, 
do they feel energy movements in the body? Uh, so like a churning washing machine in the stomach, heat rising up the spine, a sense of damped up energy, let's say in the shoulder, under the jaw, um, sense of pressure, for example, head pressure, um, uh, these kind of energy movements, um, feeling the chakras, for example, and um, then um, together with, with the energy movements and the heightened emotions, then we have um, a heightened sensitivity. So noise is too loud, lights too bright, you go into a room, you feel this has a wonderful energy or not such a good energy, you have to leave. Maybe you go into a church and you are transported into some sort of ecstasy just from the atmosphere that's in there or you go into some sort of um, cave of Stone Age people and you feel, you can sense how these people have felt there. You know, this, you know, obviously that also goes into clairvoyance. But at the beginning, this is just a very strong sensitivity. You know, this person has a bad motivation or this person says to me they're feeling good, but I can sense they're actually in a terrible despair, stuff like that. And, um, and then the, the last one is um, uh, paranormal experiences. So ghost, visions, telepathy, clairvoyance, and so on. And uh, the, the, the last criterion of paranormal experiences, that's a little bit optional. Uh, you know, if, if some, the other, uh, if they have the other four, then I say, this is a mild Kundalini awakening. And then my clients say, well, if this is mild, I don't know, I don't want to know what the real one, the, uh, the um, Kundalini awakening is like, you know, when the paranormal experiences in there as well. So it is desirable that it is mild, you know, the, the slower this starts, you know, maybe it's little experiences here and there, the better, you know, and so that you can grow into this. If this just starts like a massive uh, train crash, you know, and, uh, you know, and everything explodes, that's, that's very, very um, difficult. And that's basically why people come to me because they need help with this. You know, suddenly they get, get paranormal experience and they think they're going mad. And I say, no, you're not going mad. This is unwanted paranormal experience because you have a consciousness of, your, um, of reality. You know, this isn't normal for normal people. So that's not what, what proper psychosis is like. So I'm, I'm sure you ask me more about that later. But um, so, but, the, the one um, uh, symptom that is the most important one is the spirituality. So if that isn't there, then it's definitely not Kundalini awakening the way I define it. And um, and, uh, and the one that's optional is the paranormal experiences. Then okay. we make a plan, what shall we work about it, work with what, what is bothering you, mo you most. Often that's anxiety. And then we start with the anti-anxiety technique, which isn't so difficult. Anxiety goes down very quickly if you know how, how to work this energy body. Could you give us a, a bit of a hint as to this anxiety technique? Of course, it's it's in in your books on Kundalini, but it, could you yes. give us a sense of it? So everything I'm saying in this interview, I've, I've, it's all in my books. I'm not holding anything back. I want to help people. So... Um, Maybe it makes some references to the various books. So the anti-anxiety technique is in the uh, book, uh, Healing Kundalini Symptoms, and it's also in the book, Higher Consciousness Healing. And basically how, how it works, you know, we, Higher Consciousness Healing um, I, uh, is based on Tibetan Buddhist methods. It is Tibetan Buddhist methods, but I've given it that name to um, indicate that it's open for everybody. You don't have to a Buddhist, there's no jargon in there, no Buddhist belief that you need to take on. And um, and so everybody can do it. And, uh, you know, the, so the baseline is that you, in, in, in the first step, that you make conscious contact with your higher consciousness. And that is, you define this higher consciousness as the source of um, highest love and wisdom in the universe. And it doesn't really matter how people define that. 
people of Christian inclination, they might say God or Jesus or, you know, if you're more a new age person, then you might say divine mother or, so if you're Buddhist, you say Maitara. You know, it is, it is if, if somebody is agnostic or atheist and, and can't relate to any of this kind of idea, then we can simply say um, the part of your mind that is more loving and wise uh, than you feel at the moment, but and that you haven't got access to. But I'm not getting these people, you know, usually. Sometimes my clients bring their partner into this into the session and there might be more um, doubting and agnostic. So then we can say it's a part of your mind that's more loving and wise than you feel at the moment. And you can visualize that as a, as a beautiful light. And um, so the others, everybody has their own higher consciousness and that can also change. Today it's Jesus, tomorrow it is Kuan Yin and, and the next day it's Guru Rinpoche. You know, so people in time, they usually have a tendency to settle on one person, but there's no rush. This is like a bit like falling in love. You can't force that. And uh, so we visualize that in our heart, we imagine that light radiates out, comes around us as if hugging us. It's a very comforting experience. So it helps us to relate to this higher being like a trusting child or a, a, a child that kind of learns to trust because some people find that a bit odd because they never had these experiences and gradually they can lean back into this experience and it's a very, very healing experience. And it also gets us out of our prideful ego that says I can do it on my own and I just meditate and then I will be enlightened. Now it doesn't work that way. Enlightenment happens in a relationship, through a relationship. And, uh, and, you know, we need, we need to open up to these higher beings and let them into our, into our life because they awaken us to, to love. We need to be awakened to love by others. You know, we cannot awaken ourselves to love by ourselves. It doesn't work that way. We need to be shown love. And then we, once we are shown this love, we think, wow, this, this is so wonderful. You know, I want to be like that myself. But you can't just, you know, invent that love when you've never experienced that. You need to experience that. And that's what this relationship to the higher consciousness is all about, to, to develop that devotion and that love and that healing and that, you know, being comforted. Second step is that we imagine the light goes out, makes a, a, a beautiful light bubble around us, which has firm boundaries. Then I say to my clients, with your inner eye, uh, check these boundaries. Is there any holes or cracks in it? And if there are, then if there are holes and cracks in that, that's usually two things happen. Either this person has taken drugs or this person has experienced uh, um, abuse in some form. And I've never had a client who said, um, I have lots of holes in my bubble, who didn't have one of those, you know. If you didn't have, you know, if you never had these experiences, usually there are no holes, no cracks you have. And these bubble, uh, these, these boundaries, they represent the healthy ego boundaries, which we also need. I mean, in, um, in, in spirituality, we want to transcend the ego. We want to dissolve the ego. We want to go beyond it and experience these wonderful states of non-duality. But for everyday life, we also need a functioning normal I, let's just say, not, not the, e the egotistical ego, but the I that can say, wait a minute, this is my territory. You've just invaded me. You've just manipulated me. I don't like it. Please step out and is able to put up boundaries. This, this is important too. And this is where I bring psychotherapy and spirituality together and also explain it, how those two can be integrated. Because often you find that people are you know, doing this all the spiritual stuff and, and get maybe these states of, of um, non-duality and uh, can have that, but their private life, their relationship, they are in chaos. Or uh, they might have gone more down the psychotherapeutic route, they work on the boundaries and uh, on their sense of healthy um, ego or something like that. But they, they don't have spiritual experiences that give Give, give them access to a form of happiness that you can never 
uh, get um, to if you just do psychological work. And so, but bringing those two together, that is really the key to an all round integrated happy life. Are you <clears throat> happy in your work, in your relationship, in your home, with your body, you know, and all these things. And you have these wonderful spiritual experiences that nourish and help you um, and, 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 you know, enforce the positivity that you have in your ordinary life and the other way around, you know, because if you just had a mega argument with your partner and then you sit down for meditation, obviously that will go around in your head. You will not usually not easily go into, a, wow, I've got this wonderful bliss. I feel like the deity. That's not likely to happen. So these, these two things need to inform each other and help each other and need to get integrated. It's, and that for some people who are talented, that's quite easy. But um, for many people, that's a challenge. Okay, so where was I? Healthy boundaries. So that's all that topic. And um, third step is you tune in with the love of your higher consciousness that the higher consciousness had for you. And you say to yourself, as if you're your own best friend, very kindly, I wish myself to be happy and healed. And there you can see it is important to first have received that love from somebody else to actually be able then to say, and I can give that to myself as well. Because if you've never had that, if you had a difficult childhood or bad relationships, where are you going to get that from? You know, you, you need to have that first and then you can do it yourself. And, um, and if, you are, if you have love for yourself, if, if you stop being angry that you have all these problems and uh, angry at the world and angry at everybody or resentful or depressed. Depression is really uh, anger in slow motion. You know, it's more like a, a limp form of anger, but it's still anger. And, um, and then if you have that love, well, that's already 50% of improvement. You know, you feel instantly better, even if nothing's changed, all the turmoil is still going on in your mind and your relationship might be still very, bad or you feel lonely or something like that and um so then you have yourself as your own best friend and you are in peace with yourself even though you still have lots of problems and weaknesses okay now that's the baseline that's the foundation yeah having this trusting relationship to a higher power have healthy ego boundary and be in peace with yourself and then on that basis we can then make an intervention to change something because if you try to change something and you still, I don't want this anxiety, this is so annoying, let's get rid of it, that will never work because that angry approach, uh, you know, will just create more obstacles. So now we come to the anti-anxiety technique. And uh, basically what you need to do is to um, scan your body and notice where you feel it. So most people feel anxiety either in the chest or in the, in the upper stomach, but it can be also in all sorts of, of other places, for example, in the throat or in your abdomen and so on. So you, you clarify where that um, point is in your body. And then you imagine that the anxiety is a form of tension in your uh, energy body, which basically it is, you know, it's a mini tension. Sometimes it's also a real physical tension, like you know, anxiety in the neck, you, you pull up your shoulders and so on. But often it is just in your uh, uh, energy body. And uh, and then you imagine that the, the, the tightness is like a tight flower bud, like this. And then on the out breath, you open the flower bud, uh, releasing and relaxing that uh, tightness. And, um, and you imagine that light radiates out from that flower and, and expanding towards the end of the universe. Now, what that does, what was tight before becomes open. So this is not instantly, this is something you have to practice. It's very similar to learning an instrument. I can see a guitar behind you, so you know what it's like to learn a new uh, instrument. So you have to practice. It, does, it will not work that well when you first do it. You know, only bad sounds come out. But with a little bit of practice, even half an hour practice, you think, wow, sometime, something is um, opening, the anxiety is going down. So basically, I, I mean, when I'm there and I can guide people through that, you know, they, they get better within minutes, like three, four, five minutes. 
the anxiety, maybe it was eight on the scale, it comes down to six to five, something relaxes. And, um, and then you need to combine that with your breath. Uh, so you, you breathe in normally, and then you breathe it out normally. And then on the out breath, you open the, the flower. And then when the light comes out, you have a rest, a break on empty lungs. And while you're having breathing out and your, your, your lungs are empty, your body is in parasympathetic nerve system. And, uh, and then that, that is incompatible with anxiety. Is a bit like when you breathe into the vapor bag, it's the same logic. You know, you stop breathing in so much oxygen because the oxygen is just firing the whole thing up and it accumulates in your blood and it doesn't have the time to really get delivered into your body tissues, into the organs. And what actually happens if you breathe so fast, like you're having a panic attack, like you <laughs> or like that, you, you fill up the body with oxygen, but your body, your blood is full of oxygen, but your body is actually suffocating. And as you're suffocating, you get more anxiety. And that's a physiological anxiety. That's not even psychological. The whole thing might have happened for some psychological reason years ago, maybe lifetimes ago. We don't know. We don't even need to know. So this is very different from any kind of psychotherapy that needs that says, let's go to the the trauma in the past and relive it and then make different decisions. All of that is not necessary. It can be done much, much quicker uh, than that. And, um, and so you just do this breathing technique and you try to, to slow down your breathing all through the day and the anxiety will be gone within days, weeks, maybe one or two, two weeks. So I had one client, she's my model client in that respect. She, she had um, a, a colitis, which is an inflammation of the large intestines. And she said to me, I need to take cortisol. cortisol. Um, the doctor said that, but I've taken that before and it made me psychotic and I jumped out of the window and I nearly killed myself. And, um, and, and so, so she was extremely frightened of taking that medication and the medication would make her frightened. Now, this is the worst state I've ever seen anybody to be in. And uh, so she was very good. So she did this, this exercise, just as I described it, every hour for 15 minutes, so 15 times a day. And she said within days, she was free of all anxiety, completely free. So um, basically she is the, the, the one who, who used the technique very, very consistently and she had very, very quick results. Wow, amazing. You know, I'm curious, some of the things you're saying there, sparking a lot of, of questions. It has been suggested by, I'm thinking of, uh, for example, the psychologist and also Buddhist uh, teacher, bone Buddhist teacher, Daniel P. Brown, has talked about this deity yoga or deity uh, working with deities. One of its effects can be to repattern damaged attachment styles, for example, or repair. And you've, you've given that hint as well. You said, well, some people have not had that loving context before. And so I'm assuming by that you mean they didn't grow up in a, a context like that. And so this relating to this benevolent, unconditionally loving spiritual figure, it can be a sort of um, repatterning, a sort of ideal parent role uh, in a certain sense. You're hinting at that. Another aspect that's sometimes talked about in that context is the relationship with the counselor or therapist, actually. That the therapist, by the disposition, uh, can also temporarily serve as a kind of um, positive uh, attachment figure, in a sense, and can, in that sense, help the person to uh, develop uh, or heal, I suppose, damaged attachment uh, styles from before. Now, I'm talking a little bit perhaps too excessively in attachment style here, but the point is that. Many different psychological modalities emphasize the importance of the relationship with the counselor or therapist. So I'm curious how you see that when you're working. Are you conscious to act in certain ways or have a certain sort of disposition towards, the, towards your clients? What importance do you put on, say, the relational aspect between you and the client? The relational aspect is hugely important. It's quintessential. It's 
at the essence of everything and it's particularly also at the essence of spiritual development and uh, you know we find that very strongly let's say in a religion like christianity where where we, we only have the relationship to jesus and to god and pretty much nothing else and uh, and then a lot of people obviously get disenchanted with Christi Christianity for many reasons, um, and then they turn to um, spirituality in the East, and uh, and then we hear about meditation and enlightenment, and then we easily make the mistake of thinking, um, oh, I can just enlighten myself. I don't need to relate to some God or something, and um, but that's not true, you know. If you look carefully in, in, in the East, we, we have the relational aspect is just as important. It often comes out in the guru-disciple relationship. And then of, of course, we have a lot of scandals about that and all sorts of problematic things. But it is, uh, you know, spiritual growth happens through relationships to for, for someone, either a teacher or a Jesus type figure or a God-like figure to, enlighten us or to show us what love is and kindness and and yes you're right that's a good way of putting that repatterning attachment styles because you know we we are in our childhood we we are let's just say generally speaking we have either been deprived or we've been spoiled you know <laughs> i think rarely somebody had this perfect ideal childhood and uh, and and both negative patterns can be remedied through a positive relationship with the guru, with the therapist, with the divine uh, um, higher consciousness. And so through, um, you know, get, getting the love, getting the, the comfort, helping with this sense of loneliness, of being cut off and not having that love. But then at the same time, you know, um, even though the love of um, the deity is unconditional, I mean, there have moral guidelines they're, they're they're not like saying do everything i love you no matter what what yes you punch somebody in the face beautiful no they're not like that you know and we know that so uh, in order to have a positive relationship with the div divine being we also uh, need to aspire to have morally positive behavior and a lot of people they don't like that idea, you know, they think, oh, uh, no, no, it needs to be unconditional love, but it, it is always a coming together of contradiction. So the, the divine uh, deity, they are unconditionally loving, but they also hold us to certain standards. And if we, if we failed in that, we, 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 we will notice that in that relationship and we will say, I'm, you know, and the best thing then is, to, to, to use that shame and turn it into active regret and say, I'm really sorry, I failed. I lost my temper. I said these and these terrible words to a person who I loved, my child, and, and that was bad. And I'm really sorry and I promise not to do it again. So it's um, it's a repattering of both sides. You know, if we, let's say we were spoiled and we were we are a little bit have a um, megalomaniac, narcissistic ego, and we think nobody should criticize us, uh, through a loving relationship with the deity that can be corrected too you know because jesus and the deity they're not having our narcissistic self they don't like that and when it comes to uh, my own relationships to my relationship to my client i'm mostly in the comforting place you know giving reassurance encouragement comfort a positive view on things very very rarely do i get a client sometimes who um, is disrespectful or aggressive to me and then i also put down quite strict boundaries i'm not having that you know because uh, therapy can only succeed or, or counseling or a guru disciple relationship can only uh, succeed uh, if the if the client or the disciple is respectful and uh, appreciative of the of the teacher and in my work, uh, I, I, merged, I merged being a psychotherapist, so more a healing person with, with the teacher person. So I do that both. So you could say I'm, I'm, I'm a therapist who teaches a lot or a, a, a spiritual teacher who gives a lot of um, remedial th therapeutic interventions. And I'm not doing that thing that I give just some general teaching and everybody has to go and run with that and see if they can implement that now what i do i take one person at a time 
and help them to implement that specific teaching that will help them to dissolve their loneliness, their depression, their anxiety, their anger, and, and so forth, or their narcissism, even though narcissism is, is a tough one. <laughs> You know, the literature, the, the, the psychotherapeutic literature says God, nothing can be done. And uh, I'm, I wouldn't go that far, but I would agree that it is very difficult because the narcissistic person really um, thinks there's nothing wrong with them. So what am I to do? You know, if somebody comes to me and that says, I'm, I'm just great. You know, I just want you, Tara Springer, to, to be here to validate my great experiences. I'm not really playing along with that, but I cannot force um, the person to um, to give up the narcissism. So this is difficult. That's very interesting indeed. You're, you're mentioning narcissism there. And um, I'm curious in terms of what you've observed with the interaction of Kundalini uh, with different, what would be called, say, cluster B or access to personality disorders of various kinds, like narcissism, like uh, antisocial personality disorder, or borderline personality disorder, etc. Much has been said elsewhere about, uh, well, you know, what happens when these sorts of people have various awakenings, etc., um, spiritual awakenings, and so on, uh, stream entry, uh, so, so on and so forth. Um, there's, there's lots of discussion about that. But I'm, but I'm curious about, in your experience, specifically, Kundalini, the effect of Kundalini on, on such, uh, such people. Well, it's twofold. Um, on the one hand, it can if somebody is has some mild narcissism, it, because the Kundalini experience uh, intensifies everything, so that mild narcissism narcissism might explode and become really bad narcissism, and um, and then that person, because this is not just like ordinary narcissism that basically was there since childhood and just expanded and so on, it's more like. I'm 40 years old and suddenly I get all these temper tantrums and, uh, and, and I don't know even why, you know, and I get all these hateful thoughts about other people that they are just little worms that are there to serve me. <laughs> if it's very, very mild, you can work with humor, you know, you can just laugh at it and <laughs> this is really funny. You can also channel it if you are an artist you, or an actor, you, it makes your acting better or, or you can write a good novel when you're characters become more lifelike um so you can do it like that and if you if you watch comedians they, they can do that quite well you know that's why we love them because they can play these kind of horrible parts of us and and then we all laugh because we, we recognize ourselves so humor is a good thing if, if if it's not too bad and uh and but often uh, you know if it if if it's worse then what happens in my experience that this person recognizes reluctantly that there is something wrong with them, but the narcissism doesn't really allow for that kind of idea because after all, they are really great and easygoing and really good at meditating and <laughs> all of these things. And then, uh, then, then they seek out maybe a teacher who they know is quite straight, who will knock them into shape and then they'll relate to that teacher with a kind of love-hate relationship. So yes, um, you're a great teacher. Thank you for chastising me. I hate you. You said this and this to me. <laughs> I'm not I'm never coming back. And so this is uh, this uh, this this push-pull relationship there. And as a teacher, I mean, it's about confronting, 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 but in the right doses, not too much to see what the person can take. And, and, and also marvel at the fact how little they can take. They can only take microscopic amounts of negative feedback and already they are like in furious rage, you know, how dare you, you know, and, and, and not to overtax them and, uh, and but also, also recognize that there's nothing we can do on our side to, side to make that happen. We, we need to nurture the positive relationship and say, I, I love you. I'm really on your side. I, I really want, want um, to help you. It's a little bit like bringing up teenagers. It's not so difficult or different. 
when your teenager is in a good mood, you sit him down and say, look, this is really good for you and I want your best and only this is why I'm doing these interventions with you. But when the teenager is angry, then they're forgotten all about it and then you just need to enforce your consequences of their bad behavior. And then when they calm down again, you, know, you can have a good chat about it. And, and it's, a, it's a little bit like that, you know, just with, with an adult. But um, as I said, I think we should not hold up our hopes that we can turn around any kind of full formed uh, NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, or, or even psychopathy or any of that. The only, the only way how I've seen these kind of conditions change is through true conversion. I mean, what we used to call conversion experience you know, where somebody sees the light and then they become a born again Christian and they might maybe join a fundamentalist religion and we might think, oh, fundamentalism, they have such bad ideas and they're so rigid and, and so forth. And, but for these type of people, this is the medicine they need, you know, they're being threatened with hell. And if you do that again, you know, you go into eternal. I mean, it sounds awful, but um, some people need that to stop them doing really, really horrific things. And, uh, and they need those threats, you know, obviously when you are a little bit have to self restrain yourself, you can throw that away and you, you can say, no, there isn't such a thing as eternal hell and I don't need to be afraid of that. But some people need these big confrontations and threats. And uh, so that's why people at different stages of their development need different interventions and these different interventions can look uh, very different and contradictory. And I just want to say <clears throat> these kind of um, um, levels of consciousness, I have written a book about it, it's called Stay, uh, Stairway to Heaven and, and, and there we I've really discussed why different people at different stages of development need completely different kind of interventions. But those people usually don't come to me, you know, this is um, you know, I, I, I just get that a little bit maybe through a partner of, part of, of, of a person who comes to us in a one-to-one -one setting. There's not that much I, I could possibly do to turn people like that around. Hmm, very interesting. What's been your experience of working with, say, borderline personality disorder in these sorts of contexts? Does, do you find uh, that particular population more or less prone to Kundalini experiences and, and what occurs in their system when when such an experience happens? Um, no, I don't have borderline people at all uh, in great numbers. Uh, very odd, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I had people coming to me like this. Um, you know, uh, are they prone to Kundalini uh, awakening? Luckily not. It would just cause even more damage and chaos in their life than they already have. Um, you know, we, we see, unfortunately, um, quite a number of spiritual teachers who do scandalous things, you know, um, with sexual abuse or financial um, criminal activity and so on. So we need to assume that these people have underlying narcissistic personality disorder and, um, and you know, haven't really worked through that and used the, the power that comes from that for, for bad ends for their own selfish needs and that is basically the greatest risk in the kundalini awakening and that is why traditionally you know people were not given on mass you know shakti part which is like the touch that should awaken the kundalini or in tibetan buddhism tomo uh, which is the kundalini awakening practice it was only given in a one-to-one -one session where uh, a teacher was sure that this person had the um, mental and spiritual maturity to, to handle that. But um, there's also um, these spontaneous Kundalini awakenings and, and, and the system basically doesn't work perfectly. So um, uh, there are people who are narcissistic or egotistical who somehow also get Kundalini awakening or borderline is just, you, you could say, it's, it's basically the same thing like narcissism just in a, in a different uh, flavor, so to speak, you know. So narcissism is more typical man, borderline is more typical women, but it can also be the other way around. And, um, and basically both are 
very selfish, use other people as, as, a, as, as a source for your own egotistical needs. And unfortunately, we do see uh, that a lot in, 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 um, in spiritual circles too. And a lot of these people, uh, not a lot, but quite a number of people in positions of teachers uh, have abused these powers. And so there is personality disorder in there. And then you can ask yourself, how, how is this possible? You know, how can somebody like Muktananda or, or Sai Baba have these great, amazing positions, thousands or even millions of disciples, wonderful ashrams, very rich, you know, what else do they want? Do they really have to abuse these, these young people now? And uh, the way I explain that is that our in our chakras, you know, basically in the Tibetan Buddhist system, we have five chakras and these chakras can be enlightened to various degrees. So for example, you can have a very enlightened uh, head chakra and you have access to wisdom and you can really eloquently speak about beautifully about, um, you know, special truths. And for that, you also need an open throat chakra. So in order to, um, to um, talk about it beautifully, but um, maybe your heart is still quite close, so you don't have so much love, and your and your navel chakra is there's still all the horrible stuff, the antisocial impulses, the unresolved sexual issues. There's lots of things there, and it hasn't been really worked through, you know. And in order to work through it, you have to confront your own evilness, if you if I want to say it like that, and say, oh my God, yes, I have horrible impulses, you know, misogynistic, sexist, racist. It's all there in me. How can that be? You know, I'm a Buddhist. I, sh I shouldn't have these impulses. No, it's not true. We all have that. It's part of our animal nature, which is basically wired into our, um, into our system through this uh, kind of reptile brain that we have, which still functions like an animal and in our nervous system with the spine and going down to our sexuality, which uh, our sexuality doesn't work that differently from animals. And, and all of that is still very active in us. And, uh, and, and, and to kind of really transcend that and to work with that and not just repress sexuality or, or just put it on the side and, and say, okay, I'll just lift this type, type of sexuality. It's not really, you know, in, uh, in harmony with my spiritual beliefs, but that's, you know, I'm just just a human being, a red hearted male or whatever excuse we, we, we say we have. And so we do these kind of things. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, that then in the, in the very worst situation that can lead us to um, be this kind of charlatan who abuses people. And unfortunately that happens quite a bit. So yes, these people um, sometimes get Kundalini awakenings and a number of people who have that and have personality disorders abuse it then to become these cult leaders, charlatans, or just abusive spiritual teachers. And we've got plenty of those. And it's a big challenge. And, th and that's why Kundalini awakening has been kept secret, you know, for good reason. But then on the other hand, lots of people lose out and the Dalai Lama has uh, apparently said now that the time of secrecy is over and uh, and has encouraged people to really give these people or must to, to uh, these teachings to people or must in, uh, in in big groups and yes there's pro and cons you know and of course that's that's great and so we get access to that and um, on the other hand it has to come with a lot of warning and say you have to be on the on the path of loving kindness like a train on a train track there is no right no left you have to be on that track and if you're so firm and you even when you get very very angry you can hold your tongue and you can not say that horrible word that you want to say and you do not live your sexuality by watching pornography and uh and and, and in a way where where maybe you don't know whether these actors or actresses particularly are actually voluntarily in that scene or not. Maybe you are just watching live rape and you say, because I don't know, I just don't watch that at all. You know, at, at this time, you know, where, where pornography is everywhere, this is not an easy decision to make. But um, 
so you you have to be quite restrained to kind of really use the kundalini energy in the best way possible but then if you over restrain and you walk around like as if you're having a corset and then you get lots of kundalini symptoms so the path is very very narrow and it's not so easy to really go along gosh so it sounds like you're saying actually that the amplification effect of an experience of kundalini for example can make even latent or or, or mild tendencies um become uh, stronger uh, in fact uh -huh. and then presumably it wants strong tendencies stronger still that's right and if you're confused and you don't know what's happening and then you start having temper tantrums and then you think well, that's not, nothing wrong with that you know i'm just this, this strong person and i say what i say and and you not have this kind of moral, ethical inhibitions that you say, no, as, as a spiritual person, I shouldn't behave like that. And uh, I personally find it easier to uh, be part of a traditional religion uh, because they are more strong on the moral side of things. And uh, if you are in the, on the beautiful flower meadow of new age, then, um, you know, obviously, any kind of narcissist can just set themselves up as a local little uh, teacher and attract people. I've seen this so much, you know, it's even, even psychotherapists who do that and, um, you know, live out their own narcissistic tendencies through, through, I mean, through this kind of setup, because what wants the narcissist more than being a spiritual teacher, you know, everybody has complete devotion to you, they kiss your feet, they say everything was wonderful, you can have everything you want, uh, you can everything you want from these teachers they even give you money from these students they even give you money they give you sexual favors they, they do everything for you i mean it's a it's a narcissist dream right <laughs> and um so it's it's not not so easy and uh, in obviously i don't want to put any kind of new age teacher teacher down um, you know, it's it's just because there's less quality control, let's say, in, there's more freedom in the new age, but there's less quality control. And so people should be aware of these dangers. Of course, not so easy sometimes for uh, somebody entering a group or beginning uh, to learn from a teacher or, you know, even in a casual context to assess, actually, is this charisma and, and power to do with their spiritual you know, potency or the potential there for presumably some sort of efficacious spiritual relationship? Or is it coming from, um, like you say, a, a narcissistic aspect? Cluster B or access to personality disorders are famously charismatic. It's one of the, and seductive, one of the um, qualities we could say that's typically associated with that. That's sort of, um, that sort of a disorder or that sort of a condition. Um, so do you have uh, advice uh, for people in discerning the difference between the kind of spiritual charisma or the sense of, of the spiritual, the intensity of the spiritual uh, gaze, if you like, differentiating that from, say, it's darker and presumably less, less helpful cousins in the access to family? Well, I, uh, I like to compare that process with falling in love. I mean, when we see a person that we think he might be the one or he might be the one, we get all excited. But then, uh, and then we start dating and we, and, but then there's a phase in which we really, you know, enter a phase of uncertainty where we, where we say, is she really the one? Am I the one for her? Am I good enough? So there's like this uncertainty. And uh, a lot of people don't like, nobody likes that face, uncertainty. And uh, we, we want to jump to conclusion. We want to say, yes, this person is the one. And the same is for a spiritual teacher. Yes, I found this amazing spiritual teacher. And we don't allow ourselves to this time of testing. But we, I can only encourage people to step back and say, you know, take it easy, you know, only fools rush in. <laughs> and, uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, they say you, you should test your teacher for three years and then the teacher should test you for three years. And then after that long phase of testing, 
then you can make a strong connection. And I also want to say that even though in Tibetan Buddhism there is more quality control through the social aspect that the teachers know each other, it's as we've seen quite recently with the scandals that we also had, unfortunately, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's not, it's not foolproof. You know, there is occasionally, particularly when people come into the West, where they think they can take some liberties and, and act out the narcissistic tendencies. So it has just uh, happened with Sogyal Rinpoche and also some others. And so I'm not saying Tibetan Buddhism is the only safe religion, you know, unfortunately not. Mm -hmm. There's certain criteria that you should look out for, and that is, does the teacher do what they preach, you know, and really look out for those inconsistencies, because it's so easy that you end up in a situation like the emperor has not clothes on. <laughs> emperor says this, does exactly the opposite, and has thousands of students around them, and just don't seem to hear that, and as an outsider, you can <clears throat> easily see and say, wait a minute, he's saying do this he does that you know and uh just really check that out you know and uh, don't make a close connection with somebody who says one thing and does another and uh, then the other another thing is is love and kindness centerpiece of the the, the teaching of the teacher so maybe some teachers that go more into spiritual healing or uh or that's the main thing which is a power or in other say other powers and so then they put power before love, and that's not a good idea. So we always need to see that in a genuine teaching, um, love is always the most important thing. And um, there's a few other criteria um, that, you know, the teacher doesn't hold on to his power too much. He also uh, allows some of his disciples to become teacher themselves, so they don't hold you small all the time. Um, they they can justify whatever their teachings, you know, um, with some, you know, either they say, here's the scriptures, that's where I get it from, or they say, I channeled this from this and this higher being. Obviously, you can't take that, then, but at least you know where it com comes from. But if you have somebody who just says things, that's it, and I'm saying so, and that's how it is, I would be a little bit um, suspicious, you know, and if people, for example, write wonderful special books and you say, oh, that's wonderful. Let's go to the, uh, where they say, thank you to whom they own all this, uh, this uh, knowledge. And then there's nothing. And they pretend as if it all comes from themselves. Now that's, that's a, a nice little hint that, that they're narcissistic. Because we, we learn things from others, you know, it doesn't just, sprout in our own mind very rarely and uh, even if we have the most amazing uh, intuitions or channelings as you know we asked me in the last interview I do a lot of channeling myself you know I've compared uh, everything with the, with the Buddhist teaching and anything that uh, that would have looked like this is not compatible with what I've learned from a Buddhist teacher I would have thrown out anyway luckily that wasn't the case so I didn't wasn't in that conundrum but um, you know, you know, you have to, um, you know, somehow provide some evidence. So basically, a bit like a scientist, a scientist needs to always say, "I learned that here. I did that experiment there, and this double blind stu study there." And they always have to provide proof. And, and in the spiritual realm, we we have to do that too. You know, we um, we have to say, "I learned that from this teacher, and that goes into this lineage." In Tibetan Buddhism, they're very strong on their lineages, and it goes right back to twelve hundred years ago. Um, to this female mystic Siddha Rani and uh, or Tilupa or Narupa or all these uh, people who you know way back in the past and then we have thousands of people have used these teachings to very good effect and now that none we have some evidence and then we say okay that seems to be safe now I'm quite conservative in that respect I quite like to be safe you know because I, <laughs> I know how you can crash on those spiritual paths it's not it's not a kindergarten it's not a flower uh, meadow you you know you're playing with uh, forces in your mind and if you go wrong you can easily end up being very confused and even you know worse go into quite a crisis yeah i wonder if i might ask you about that this is so fascinating you're now talking about checking yourself actually and watching yourself 
And so the sort of work you do, you're bridging different worlds, spirituality, etc. Also psycho psychotherapy, spiritual experiences, psychological experiences, etc. Life circumstances and so on. How do you check yourself? Presumably, you'll have some clients that will adore you, uh, think you're the most amazing thing. Some, depending on what's up in their psyche, I suppose, may have times of really disliking you and uh, demonizing you, etc. for example, or, you know, but even on a more mundane level, many people coming to you for advice, wanting to know the truth, the wisdom, can you give me the answers? This sort of flow of uh, regard coming towards you, how do you keep yourself straight in the face of of that sort of uh, that sort of a situation, all right. In, in the work you do. So, so um, this is not so difficult because we have something built into us that tells us when we're going going wrong. It's called a bad conscience or shame, <laughs> and and we all have access to that, and it happens in all of that. Just some people are very good at denying that and cutting that off, and the narcissistic people they also have shame. Mm but they can somehow cut that off. And then if you insist that they should face the shame, then they get furious and they sort of tantrum because they just don't want to. But they do have that function in their mind. We all do. So that's one thing. But then we also get some help. And one is called the 10 precepts in Christianity. And we have a similar thing like that in Buddhism, the, the 10 ways of creating bad karmas. And they are actually remarkably similar, those two. And um, don't steal, don't lie, don't say bad gossip behind people's back, speak in a beautiful voice, don't use foul language, and so forth, you know. Uh, and um, however, uh, these, these uh, precepts need to be interpreted. For example, I have a rat infestation in my house, and I shouldn't kill. Should I let the house go to the rats now? The answer in, in Buddhism is no, and I give you some some nice stories for that, you know, for example, with the, with the captain gone mad and the captain wants to guide the ship into this iceberg. And then the question is, the Buddha asked some of his disciples, oh, sh should the, 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 the people on the ship let that happen or should they kill the, the, um, the captain? And the answer is they should kill the captain. So in this, and, and save the hundred people on the ship. On the ship. So in this case, um, we sacrifice one person in order to save a hundred. And in the same way, um, you um, you can kill, you know, the bed bugs and the rats and, and the ants that are in your house. <laughs> Even though the ants, I was once living in a house and every, every May and June, all the ants that came and they made long streets through my sitting room and I let them all go. And then, and then I just put some double, uh, uh, sided tape around the kitchen door so they couldn't come into the kitchen and I've also made it around all the t the table legs so they couldn't come up the table. <laughs> I let them go through, through the house eventually I realized where they all came from they were in, in some they were living in a flower pot so I threw the plant out so that saved the situation but um so we we can and, and we have to to come to this moral good decisions not always that easy you know and um if you are getting ripped off by some sort of car rental uh company who wants to 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 now charge us for the clutch that we apparently broke but clearly we didn't break it they didn't repair it they gave us the old car and now they're you know a thousand pounds you have to pay it in, in that situation, is it okay to, to say a lie to get out of it, you know, because clearly they're, they're having it on with you. And, and, and so, so these kind of questions, you know, it's, it's, you know, we have to try hard to find, to justify our actions. Now for myself, I, I have a history of being incredibly hard on myself, you know, um, so a lot of women, women tend to do that more than men and so for me this isn't very difficult you know I still I still need to be working on being not so hard on myself you know just take it a bit more easy and and uh, and 
so for me, this isn't this isn't this is an easy thing for me, but I also know it's not easy for other people. This is one thing where my bad childhood, <laughs> my overly critical parents, uh, you know, helped me in some ways because. Uh, you know, this kind of self-criticism that I developed because of that, because I thought I was bad. You know, children do think that when they're, you know, it comes me in <laughs> has some advantage uh, to, to always assume that I've done something wrong. I need to do this better. And uh, yes, and I, I'm very strong on that point, you know, and I'm utterly determined that I will not be a teacher or um, who were once known for, for their scandalous behavior. You know, this is, this is not in my nature and I don't think it will happen. Very interesting indeed. You know, um, another question that comes to my mind, seeing as we're really focusing on your clinical experience here with, with, your, with your thousands of clients, have you noticed any differences in either proportion of people who are having Kundalini experiences or in the type or intensity of Kundalini experience between different demographics, such as differences between men and women or differences between age range, uh, for example, socioeconomic? Not so much, you know, um, I have, what I noticed in demographics is, for example, because I'm having an international uh, Kundalini practice, and I talk to people from many different countries, uh, that if somebody uh, uh, lived in a Catholic country, Ireland, Poland, Spain, and so on, they, have, they tend to have more um, guilt and they are putting themselves down more strongly than the people from Protestant countries that I have not noticed. Um, I think I have a bit more female clients than male clients, but I think that's in part of the nature of this, that women quite like to go and seek help from somebody else and men I don't want to be too cliche <laughs> but maybe that plays a role with that um when it comes to why do people have kundalini awakenings you know uh, it doesn't matter who you are how much education you have how much money you have it doesn't matter at all what that has to do with is only and only your desire to expand your consciousness and if you expand your consciousness and you start reading the spiritual books and you go and do some uh, meditation then it will happen at some point you know it just you know it's just a matter of time you know and as we are on that topic what what i've noticed of course caused most kundalini awakenings um in my from the people who come to me so Reason number one is the 10 day um, silent retreat of Goenka. And um, now that's very interesting because that type of meditation they do, they, they don't even recognize Kundalini. And if people get the Kundalini awakening and they say, I've got these and these symptoms, then usually they just send people home. And, and then they come to me and they're very bitterly disappointed that they didn't understand that. So that's part of the spiritual growing up. <laughs> Not everybody who teaches social development is actually equipped to actually, uh, you know, see when it is actually uh, start to really unfold. Same, same is true for Kundalini Yoga. A lot of uh, instructors of Kundalini Yoga don't have a Kundalini awakening themselves, and when their clients have it, they don't recognize it, and they might get afraid, and they think that's very strange. Now you should see a psychiatrist. <laughs> No, the Kundalini awakening, that the very thing you're teaching. And so there's a lot of lessons to be learned. It's a big wild garden of spirituality. <laughs> nice and confused and beautiful and abusive and everything mixed up. That's been so fascinating. I would love to do a third one if you if if you're open to that. In particular to talk about Siddhi, which we didn't get to today at all and paranormal experiences. You've written that everyone who has a Kundalini awakening will have paranormal experiences sooner or later. And you list some really quite remarkable ones. Yes, um, so some people, as I said before, they don't have that from the beginning, but at some point they will. Uh, you know, what can we experience? Seeing ghosts, um, contact to the dead, um, people who have passed over, um, seeing angels, experience them, 
telepathy, clairvoyance, premonitions, uh, remote viewings, spiritual healing. I mean, the list is long, long and beautiful. And uh, the cities and the, the paranormal experiences, obviously, that very much overlaps. And um, so um, some people are very frightened about that. They don't have to. This is just a new dimensions of life and uh, like a big different room that opens in, in, in their life. And they just need a bit of a tour guide to show them around. Look, this is how that works. So I am the tour guide then. <laughs> and uh, also people are afraid of entity attachment on all that kind of thing. Um, we need to understand that this can never happen unless we don't give these entities permission, consciously or unconsciously, so usually unconsciously. And uh, so these entities that don't have a physical body, we have a physical body compared with them. We are like a nuclear power station. And so they cannot do anything other than their feed of our, our attention and our permission. And if you give them attention, if you're interested, what they have to say if, if you go in an inner dialogue, yes, then that can happen. Fashion way is saying making a pact with the devil, you know, you know, just having some powerful being coming you, to you and, and and allowing that to give you more rageful, furious energy, you know, or, or you know, more power to do stuff. Uh, we need to be aware of that. And um, but basically. In the paranormal world, we need to understand that this subject-object division that we have in our ordinary world, like I'm here and you are over there and we don't mix up, even though that isn't strictly true, you know. I mean, if you were in the same room with me, we would breathe in the same air and, uh, and, and I can feel maybe your emotions and you can feel mine and there's all sorts of things that gets mixed up. Um, but let's just say on an ordinary level, we assume you're over there, I'm here and we are separate uh, on the paranormal uh, level that's not true anymore so anything that that ex we experience as other you know an entity is also ourselves so because it needs our permission and uh so in the end of the day it all boils down to that we can say any kind of strange experience that we have in our mind the best way to deal with that is to see it as a, some sort of sub personality to assume as assume it's part of us and then and then we can work with that and we can uh, either say no that's a part that i don't like i i will ignore it and the best way to get rid of that is to not fight with that because in a fight you kind of train that otherness you make it bigger bigger and more other but if you ignore it it you starve it of energy and and it will and uh, disappear and then when, when he comes back and you think, ah, there it is again, don't go into dialogue, don't get upset about it, just keep ignoring it. And, you know, because that lift of our attention, if you know that, if you understand that, it's very easy how to get rid of it again. So just ignore it. And if the ignoring is difficult, if you get the so-called horror vision, where you, see, where you see some really horrible, horrific, scenes or entities some people feel like it's, you know let's say they lie in bed in the darkness and then they think they're in hell or something like that um or then what you do is um you you say a mantra and you visually you put your mind on your higher consciousness you recollect it as if you learned a poem by heart and you trace the outline of their hair their ornaments their facial features, and at the same time, you say very quickly, higher consciousness by their name, like I would say, White Tara, I take refuge to you, White Tara, I take refuge to you, White Tara, I take refuge to you, while I trace her the outlines of her ornaments. So visually, my mind is completely occupied, or through the ears, it's also completely occupied. And when we, that will ward off any kind of thing that might want to come in our mind of we need to do that 10 20 seconds then this attack is over and then then we can maybe fall asleep or and and then this will be over and if, if it comes back you just say it again so this is how to deal with these horror visions and which is the most difficult thing with the paranormal experience you know, that people get horror visions but mm. they very easily 
get rid of. That's so fascinating. And in your books, you detail many of these sorts of experiences and different scenarios and different situations, as well as ways of relating relating to them and dealing with them. You've given, I think, the essence, the essence principles here. And also you're talking about cities and various things, how to cultivate them, uh, etc., how to use them, how to avoid their dangers and pitfalls. It's fascinating. I, I think that really is an episode in itself. So perhaps we could make this uh, duo of episodes a triptych, a trio. Uh, that's, I think, uh, why not? <laughs> so if you'd be willing to do that, I think that would be really fantastic. And um, perhaps we could begin right there in the paranormal in the city. That'd be very cool indeed. Well, anyway, uh, Tara Springett, this has been so fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.